in children or even in adults, when you examine them, you know, the office is cold, they're nervous, whatever it may be, the cremasteric muscle will tighten up. And the cremasteric muscle is just like your bicep muscle. It'll, you know, it'll pull it up. And so what you actually have to do is you have to feel for that testicle, then you bring it down. And then you hold it there for, you know, about a couple minutes. And the rationale for doing that is it's a red fiber muscle. So it gets tired just like your, um, you know, your biceps or whatnot. And so by tiring it out, then what you do is after two minutes, I let it go. If the Tesco kind of stays down there and doesn't move back up, then that's by definition retractile testicle. And typically what I do is I free uh, I free the hernia if if there's a hernia um, from the spermatic artery in the vein and then hernia in children we really don't use mesh to fix not not for this I usually just put a dissolvable stitch in and then and then that's it I don't remember having a recurrence uh, by doing it that way. And that's how that's what most surgeons do anyways. You don't fix uh, inguinal hernia uh, for undescended testicle, generally speaking, 99% of the time using mesh. Usually all it takes is a dissolvable suture. And then after that, I just close everything up and then we put glue on the incision to kind of keep it priceless. Take it to the moon. Priceless. One day will be soon. What is price? Hi everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of D Talk with Dr. Fam. So today we're gonna talk about undescended testicle. So Basically, uh, people have reached out to me to talk about different topics. And one of the topic they wanted to, um, for me to talk about is undescended testicle. So let's just talk about descended testicle first, and then we'll talk about the undescended, undescended testicle and then kind of the management of that. So basically, the testicle kind of start below the kidneys in life, so in the womb. And... On my scrub here, you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but basically these are two kidneys. That's the bladder. But the testicle kind of start, you know, roughly kind of below the kidney. And what it does is it travels down into the inguinal canal. And the inguinal canal is literally just kind of this little area right here. Now, and then once it travels down there, and if you think about it, it's pretty amazing, you know, uh, how something as simple as a Tesco can find its way down to the scrotum without uh, any sort of guidance that, you know, that we know exists. Obviously, there has to be some sort of guidance, right? But that's why I'm always fascinated about the human body. But once it travels down to that inguinal canal, then, and goes into the scrotum, and it's led by something called the gubernaculum. I won't go into all the signaling and the pathway and all that. You know, this is more of a general kind of talk so that parents or patients can understand, you know, about undescended testicle. So once it travels down there, that little hole, the inguinal canal is supposed to close. If that hole doesn't close, then it will allow fluid to travel back and forth between the abdominal area and then the inguinal area. And that's what we call a hernia. And so basically, uh, if you know, and it's rare, undescended testicle and inguinal hernia, if you look at the overall general population, it's not super common. But it is, for a pediatric urologist, it is a, a kind of a bread and butter thing that we do. And so in children that are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in children that have undescended testicle, basically all that means is that somewhere along the pathway, the testicle just didn't make its way down there. And what caused the testicle to not make its way down there? No one really has a good answer. And research to look into the reason why is very expensive. And so now with research dollars drying up, you know, I think 
a lot of the research money are being put towards more studies like cancer and stuff like that because at the end of the day undescended testicle really is a surgical disease and or surgical pathology and so this is just me guessing but my guess is that not a lot of work is being put into why exactly the testicle doesn't go down the way it should versus like kidney cancer research and i think the reason why is because at least with kidney cancer research you can um, immunotherapy is a new thing now right instead of chemotherapy you know a lot of uh, uh, research and development goes into immunotherapy and so by knowing kind of the mechanism of what caused kidney cancer will help develop immunotherapy uh, drugs versus if you found out what caused the Tesco not to go down, what is it going to change? Nothing. Because you're not going to, you know, give medicine and all of that to try to bring it down. Now, <clears throat> and this is a difference of opinion, but generally speaking, I don't really think there's a role to give testosterone to try to bring the testicle down. Um, I do know patients are getting that, but generally speaking, I think the general consensus is probably testosterone, giving testosterone to bring the testicle down is probably not a mainstream uh, or really standard of care um, thing. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I don't think that success rate is very high um, and you only have a limited window that you can do it, um, you know, where you give the testosterone with the intent that uh, testosterone or a variant of it with the intent that the Tesco would then drop. So now let's say that, you know, a patient or your child has undescended Tesco, then first thing you got to do is make sure that is it really undescended testicle or is it retractile testicle because they're very different and what i mean by that is retractile testicle is all males have what we call cremasteric muscle and so the testicle needs to be kind of in a cooler environment and so that's why guys, when they're cold, the cremasteric muscle will contract and pull the Tesco up. And then when it's hot or they're in the shower or whatnot, the Tesco tend to drop because um, the, you know, it's the, the Tesco kind of the cremasteric muscle helps regulate the temperature of the Tesco by moving it up and down. And so now maybe millions of years ago, that mechanism may have been helpful, but now in this day and age, we live in air conditioned areas and we have heating and cooling. And so I don't think the cremasteric reflex is really that important anymore in trying to regulate the temperature for the testicle. Because if the testicle and what I mean by regulation of uh, the testicle, what I'm referring to is if the testicle is closer to the abdomen, the like consistently, it will be warmer. And when it's warmer, the testicle will tend not to grow as well as a testicle that is an, in its anatomical position. Okay. Now, Let's talk about undescended testicle now that, you know, because everyone knows descended testicle. Now, you can also have descended testicle with a hernia. And what I mean by that is the testicle may have descended all the way, but the hole didn't close. And how you can tell is there's really no imaging to diagnose that. It's really clinical uh, observation. So what I mean by that is parents would watch and see you know look at their child to see like when the child cries or um, if he lifts something heavy and this goes the same for adults too when they cry or they lift something heavy they're actually increasing abdominal pressure when you increase abdominal pressure it will cause fluid and sometimes bowel if the hernia is big enough 
to actually go down there and you'll see a bulge. So basically, if you're lifting something heavy or you're, you know, you're uh, using the bathroom and having to valsalva or what I call increasing abdominal pressure, and then you notice one side of the scrotum, or it could be both sides, uh, like under H2, you have, if you have hernia on one side, there's a good chance you may have hernia on the other side. So if you're, you know, if you're increasing the pressure and then suddenly you see swelling, then that's pretty much a hernia until proven otherwise. And so then, you know, you go get examined by your physician and then, you know, typically your physician will try to replicate that. Now, you know, there's this thing where people, where the physician put the finger in kind of the scrotal area and then have you cough. You know, I really don't do that because, uh, you know, there's a lot of data to show that's just not very accurate. What's the most accurate non-surgical wise? The, what's most accurate is actually clinical observation. So just observe it. Now, if you have a hernia that's large enough where bowel can get stuck in there, then this, what it will present as, and this is, and this is, I'm referring to Tesco that has already descended or Tesco that has not descended. And if you have a hernia and bowel or whatnot kind of found its way down there and then it gets choked off so it gets edematous or swollen and it can't get back up, well, then that's a medical emergency. And you'll know because uh, let's just assume the hernia is on the right side. It'll be really red and swollen and painful. There may be vomiting, whatnot. You push on a scrotum. You can't push the stuff back in. So now that doesn't necessarily mean you have a hernia because there could be other pathology uh, from the testicle that can cause you to have swelling. So it's not necessarily just the hernia. But if you have a history of a hernia, then that is a medical emergency. And you probably should go to the nearest ER where there's uh, <clears throat> appropriate surgeons that can you know, re potentially reduce the, the hernia uh, surgically without having to cut out dead bowel or anything like that. But like I said, incarceration is actually not very common. And if you're talking about tiny hernias, then, you know, there's some data that supports maybe up to 18 months, it can close spontaneously. Um, you know, that's a conversation you just have to have with, to have with parents, um, you know, because it's hard to determine the size of a hernia unless it's just obvious. Like, you know, normally the scrum is the size of a walnut or a cherry. And then next day it's the size of a tangerine, but you're able to push it back in and, you know, and all that, then, you know, those type of hernia probably is not going to close. Now, that's in male. Females can also have hernias. Typically, female hernias, probably 100% of the time, you will need to fix it. Uh, and the reason why you fix female hernias is no different than why you fix male hernias. And it's because the ovaries, well, with the exception of the ovaries, obviously males don't have ovaries, but bowel, ovaries, you know, all of those can get stuck in the hernia. And if it gets swollen, then, you know, that's a medical emergency. So in females, the presentation is the same. You will see a swelling, but females don't have scrotum. So typically in females, when they get swelling, you'll when they're crying or whatnot, you'll see like a bulge, kind of like right here. And female hernias are very tricky because they may seem small, but surgically, they're actually pretty big once you actually surgically go in there to fix it. And so now let's go back to, um, excuse me, <clears throat> let's go back to uh, undescended testicle. So that's, that's basically how the testicle descend. Now in undescended testicle, um, basically about three months of life, typically about 70 to 75% of testicle that's palpable, okay? Meaning that on physical exam, you actually can feel the testicle. Then 
the uh, you know at three months of life 75 percent will descend by six months of life typically 90 to 95 percent will descend so my practice pattern is if your testicle when i first exam examine the testicle and then at six months you know at three months and then at six months when i examine and the testicle just has not moved anywhere then at that point i tell the parents you know the testicle just needs to be brought down within the first year of life. Now, there's data to show that the sooner you bring the testicle down, the higher the chance that that testicle can grow to be similar in size to the contralateral or the opposite testicle. Well, that makes sense, right? Because if you have a testicle that's undescended and it's not developing normally, well, then, you know, it makes sense that if the longer it stays up there, then you know, the longer it's not in the environment that it needs to be to thrive. And so it will shrink. And so, um, you know, so typically what I do is uh, by six months, if I haven't descended, I typically will operate. And then after the uh, one year mark, then the longer the Tesco is up there, then the lower the chance that that Tesco will be able to grow to be similar in size to the contralateral or the opposite testicle and so and then after that is the puberty group once you hit puberty and your testicle is still undescended then the chance of that undescended testicle growing to be the same size as the testicle that has descended it's going to be fairly low and so i get referrals all the time and when I take the history I ask parents and they would tell me that you know they were told to wait you know until they're two or three or four which I have no idea where you know where these numbers are coming from but what I'm quoting you is really the standard of care number is by three months, if it's still super high up in the inguinal area, then, and this is palpable, meaning that you have to be able to feel it, then I usually just give parents the option of, okay, well, you know that 75% should have dropped by now. And if it hasn't, then I give parents the choice of, do they want to intervene so that there's no more insult that can occur? Whatever insult that has already occurred is either going to stay or go away. But there's no guarantee that if you bring the testicle down, that that testicle won't continue to shrink. But generally speaking, if you operate early, that testicle will have a good chance of, of making it or at least growing to be the same size as the other, the other testicle. Now, <clears throat> when, you know, when I counsel uh, parents or patients, I never really give them the option of testosterone to try to bring the testicle down just because I don't think there's good data to support giving testosterone to bring the testicle down. Uh, because testosterone has its own risk too. We, we won't go into that, but it, my practice pattern is I don't, I, I don't really uh, think that testosterone is uh, you know, there, there's more data, I guess, to, s to support bringing it down surgically than uh, would than using uh, uh, um, testosterone. Now, that's for Tesco that's palpable. Okay. Now let's go. Let's go back a little bit and talk about the retractile testicle. Retractile Tesco, on the other hand, don't need to be operated on. And what I mean by retractile Tesco. So in children or even in adults, when you examine them, you know, the office is cold, they're nervous, whatever it may be, the cremasteric muscle will tighten up. And the cremasteric muscle is just like your bicep muscle. It'll, you know, it'll pull it up. And so what you actually have to do is you have to feel for that testicle, then you bring it down. And then you hold it there for, you know, about a couple minutes. And the rationale for doing that is it's a red fiber muscle. So it gets tired just like your, uh, you know, your biceps or whatnot. And so by tiring it out, then what you do is after two minutes, I let it go. If the Tesco kind of stays down there and doesn't move back up, then that's by definition retractile Tesco. 
So retractile testicle, you can think of it as a, a, you know, an anatomical variant. We don't operate on those. I think years ago they did, but what we found out was only about 5% of patients that have retractile testicle, which means testicle that I'm able to feel, bring it down, hold it there for two minutes, then let it go. And if it stays down there for, you know, even 30 seconds, I, uh, then I consider that retractile testicle, then I don't operate on those. With those, I follow them until puberty when you know the theory is that testosterone starts circulating and whatnot and then the testicle tend to stay down more than um, up and we don't really know why some kids have you know a more hyperactive cremasteric reflex than other uh, children but what we do know is only about five percent so what i do is think of the five five rules usually 5% of children with retractile testicle will go on to need surgery because it will become undescended. And so once they get longer, you can no longer bring the testicle down like that. So where the other five comes in is usually by age five is where a lot of them will declare, meaning that the retractile testicle will declare itself and then become undescended. And then once it becomes undescended, then you operate. And the surgery for uh, a palpable testicle is it's not really a big surgery at all. It's um, not painful uh, within probably the first 24 hours. And all you do, the surgery, all I do is I just make a little inscision kind of right here in the inguinal area, maybe about that big or so. And the skinnier the child, the easier the surgery because Literally, once you make that incision, then you just go down and then you can find the testicle right there. Then what I do is I free up the testicle along with the crem cremasteric muscle. And then I make a second incision in the scrotum to create what we call a dartos pouch, D-A-R-T-O-S. And that's just a pouch where I can bring the testicle down after I free up every surrounding tissue from the spermatic cord which contains the blood supply and the vas deferens which is the tube that transports sperm someday and then i would bring it down there and then i would tack it down there with now you can use anything to tack it down there i per personally just like permanent um, so i use something called a proline suture uh, but you don't have to use uh, permanent sutures. I just found that when I use permanent sutures, I have less risk of recurrence. Um, now, that's just anecdotal. And, but the, for me, the permanent suture, you know, they really can't feel it. You really can't see it. And so for me, if it's something that really doesn't cause any sort of kind of morbidity, uh, then i rather play it safe and use a permanent suture to kind of hold the testicle down there. But the key to keeping the testicle down there is A, a good pouch. So you really need to create a good pouch that the testicle can lay in. And then number two, you I'm, I kind of close where the test where the scrotum kind of meets the inguinal canal i kind of close that with a suture to kind of make the hole a little bit tighter so it'll help prevent the testicle from getting pulled up because sometimes when you heal especially for the older children where you know after you dissect out everything the the, the spermatic cord is still tight i think by doing that it really does help um, hold it down there while the spermatic vein, artery, and vas deferens kind of get stimulated to grow. And then, you know, at first you'll see kind of this picture where, you know, the right scrotum, if we're operating on the right side, is kind of getting pulled up, but that's not a permanent thing. Eventually it will kind of flow down just like the right side. And then if a hernia is encountered, 
then usually, and we, and you, I do this under magnification, which is those, you know, you've seen those surgeons wear the glasses with the magnification on there. They're called loops. So I wear those so that I can see what I'm doing. And typically what I do is I free, uh, I free the hernia if, if there's a hernia um, from the spermatic artery in the vein. And then hernia in children, we really don't use mesh to fix. Not, not for this. I usually just put a dissolvable stitch in and then, and then that's it. I, I just never, I don't remember having a recurrence uh, by doing it that way. And that's how, that's what most surgeons do anyways. You don't fix uh, inguinal hernia uh, for undescended testicle, um, generally speaking, 99% of the time using mesh. Usually all it takes is a dissolvable suture. And then after that, I just close everything up and then we put glue on the incision to kind of keep it clean. The pain, depending on the age, but um, under age one, usually by tomorrow, they're pretty much back to normal. In adults, maybe two or three days, but it's not debilitating pain, but it's more of like, you know, you just had surgery, you know, it hurts. So, you know, but it's not debilitating where you can't walk or anything like that. And so, um, because in children, the reason why is I don't really cut the muscle to get to the testicle. I split the muscle. And I think that's with the exception of where the scrotum is, you really can't split the dartos muscle. You kind of have to incise it. And so uh, we do cut the cremasteric muscle because you don't want it to go back up. But for some reason in children, typically their pain is very manageable. Usually after 24 hours or so, they, they do pretty well. And I really don't have restrictions with the exception of, you know, no bouncy chairs or uh, bicycle or whatnot. Um, for about two or three weeks and purely just because I don't want them to it's not like they can ruin anything but you know it can cause pain when you're pressing on the area that you just get operated on and so now that's for palpable testicle now you can also run into something called non-palpable testicle so basically what that means is there's no testicle that can be felt now I know a lot of ultrasounds get ordered because of, um, you know, the, because of the undescended testicle, but really ultrasound is almost useless to determine if the testicle is undescended or not. And a perfect reason why is this, even though they warm the gel, the problem is whenever you examine a child, they're going to be nervous. And so, and even adults. And so what's going to do, what's going to happen is naturally their, go, their cremasteric muscle is going to contract. And so when the ultrasonographer does the ultrasound, they're always going to call it undescended testicle. Well, not always, but you get the gist. The testicle get pulled up, they do the ultrasound, and then what they see, they'll document, oh, the testicle is in the scro uh, it's in the inguinal canal, but it's not really in the inguinal canal. It's because the child was just nervous and so it got pulled up and so but for a non-palpable testicle you know basically an ultrasound you know it maybe will do some good but generally speaking ultrasound really don't have much of a role when it comes to undescended testicle it's really physical exam especially by a pediatric urologist and so when i can't feel the testicle then what I tell parents is the patient will need to undergo a procedure where I need to put a camera or a laparoscope. So I just make a little tiny incision to the belly button and then I would look. And what I do is let's just say that I couldn't feel the testicle on the left side. So then I would look and we know the pathway of the testicle. So with the camera, you can look to see is the testicle in the abdomen. And the scenarios you will encounter will be this. One, you the uh, blood vessel just blindly end. Well, if that happens, then you're done. There's nothing else that needs to be done. So then what I do is I call out to the room and I ask parents if they want me to perform an orchidopexy on the right side. And why is that? 
just the sheer fact of being a male, you run the risk of testicular torsion. And testicular torsion, that means that the testicle just twists by itself. And that usually, the highest incident usually occurs in the teenage years. And the problem is with guys or with teenagers, you know, they probably won't bring that up until the pain's bearable. And the salvage rate is low because of timing. You have about six hours from the time that the Tesco twisted until the time that the Tesco gets untwisted. And so sometimes they'll do maneuvers like uh, manual detorsion. So just remember open book, meaning that if you want to detours it, you twist it like this. So it's kind of like you're opening a book. Now the success rate on that obviously is not going to be high. If you suspect testicular torsion, what you need to do is just go to the emergency room and ultrasound will be performed. Or if there's just such high clinical suspicion, you can bypass the ultrasound if you're limited on your time and you're trying to salvage that testicle within six hours. You can just take the patient straight to the OR if the history matches, which is, you know, suddenly I, I was just doing, you know, doing my usual activities. Suddenly I noticed severe pain in my left side and I have swelling and it's just hurting. I'm throwing up. Well, you know, in a healthy child that has that history, you know, it takes time to do the ultrasound, right? So if you have a high clinical suspicion, you can just go ahead and take the patient to the OR and, uh, and you know, do a uh, or uh, orchidopexy, which means you detours it if it's still alive. And then you put three quadrants sutures in so that it can't twist. So back to the undescended uh, non-palpable testicle. So if I see a blind ending vessel, that means that the testicle just never developed. So what we call vanishing testicle. And so with that, when that happens, then what I do is I call out to the room and I ask the parents, do they want me to, do they want me to prophylactically orchidopex the right side to prevent testicular torsion in the future, even though testicular torsion is rare. But if you're on vacation or something like that, and you have testicular torsion and you can't get to a hospital that's within six hours of that time frame, pretty much that child's going to be non-fertile now. And so, so that's my, that's my practice pattern. Now, if you <clears throat> put a camera in there <clears throat> and you actually see the spermatic vessel exit the inguinal canal, then that means that Either the child may be a little bit, you know, on the heavier side and, you know, the surgeon just couldn't palpate it because of, uh, you know, the fat or whatnot. And so typically in those situations, I will then now make an inguinal incision to explore to see if that testicle really is there and I just couldn't feel it. And then if the testicle is there, then obviously we bring it down. The third scenario you're going to run into is the Tesco actually is in the abdomen. Then if the Tesco that's in the abdomen, then my practice pattern is I usually will do a stage procedure. So what we call a stage orchidopexy or a Fowler-Stevens. And what I mean by that is in a Fowler-Stevens, what I'm actually doing is the Tesco consists of three blood supply. One comes from the cremasteric muscle. One comes from the artery that provides uh, blood to the vas deferens as well as to the Tesco and then the main artery. Well, usually what's preventing the Tesco from descending is the main artery. So what I do in a stage procedure is I just laparoscopically put in two more five millimeter ports and then you cut off the main supply to the testicle, which is what's prevent, which is what's tethering it. And then you bring the patient back in probably six months. And uh, the reason why is the blood supply to the vas deferens, which will be the main blood supply to the testicle now, is not very robust. So if you try to bring it down the same day, you're putting the vessel on stretch. And when you put the vessel on stretch, you're not going to get very good flow. So your success rate will be around 50%. Versus if you wait about six months where the blood supply 
can collateralize or what we call, you know, collateralize collateralization means that the blood supply is going to be, you know, stronger by doing that. Then I would go back in at six months through the same three ports. And then now I will bring down the testicle laparoscopically and, you know, and the surgery is the same. You create a little dartos pouch with the exception of you don't really make an inguinal incision. Now, I actually will take the, you know, in two stage, I will actually bring the test. I don't make a new canal. What I do is where the old uh, inguinal canal is, I would bring the testicle into that canal and then into the, te the scrotum. Uh, it's just surgeon preference. The only reason why I do that is I think there's less risk of bladder injury, even though bladder injury is very low, because when you do a neo canal, uh, what you're actually doing is you're creating a space next to the bladder. And so obviously you can get into the bladder. Um, and so, and then number two, I just think it's, a uh, you know, bringing it through the natural uh, canal just gives it, uh, you know, a more natural anatomy. Um, but sometimes that may not be possible due to length. Uh, but I, that hasn't been the case for me. Um, I have found that whether I bring it through a neo canal, which means a new canal that I create versus the patient's inguinal canal, I have not had that problem. Uh, because you can probably, you can get pretty decent length. And then, and then that's what you call a stage uh, um, um, Fowler-Steven or stage orchidopexy. Now, why do you actually bring the Tesco down? So I know a lot of people think that we bring the Tesco down because of hormone and fertility. Remember, you only need one testicle to have hormone and fertility. And there's a lot of data to support that. The reason why you bring the Tesco down is so that your physician can examine it once a year. And then later on, when the child's old enough, you know, I'm going to teach or the physician's going to teach the child or the teenager how to examine his Tesco once a month for lumps and bumps <clears throat> to make sure it doesn't uh, form into cancer. OK, and so that's the main reason why you bring it down is you bring it down so that if it does develop into cancer, then you can feel it. Now, what is the incidence of undescended testicle having cancer? That's a very controversial thing. But one thing I can tell you is this. The incidence of testicular cancer is probably one out of half a million. So even if you're up in the abdomen where let's say your risk of cancer is 50 times the general population, 50 times out of half a million is still a very low number. And when you're in the inguinal canal, obviously it's going to be less, right? It, your risk is only going to be like 10%, 20%, something like that above the, uh, I'm sorry, not 20%, 20 times or 10 times the general population. Well, if you look at it, 10 or 20 out of half a million is still a very low number. But the key to get from this is you bring the testicle down so that it doesn't develop into tumor or at least decrease the risk of it developing into tumor by bringing it down. And then if it does develop into tumor, you can feel it and know that, you know, it developed into tumor because we have had... I've had a patient that's 21 years old that basically presented with chest pain, hard time breathing. We did a CAT scan, show metastatic disease everywhere. It turns out he had an undescended testicle that metastasized. Um, I won't talk about uh, the treatment of metastatic testicular cancer. Uh, that's a whole new episode. But, but generally speaking, that's the real reason why you bring down the testicle. Number two, you don't really need an ultrasound for to diagnose undescended or non-palpable testicle. That's something that's diagnosed with physical exam. Uh, but I do know that a lot of ultrasounds are ordered because of that, but really you don't need it. What you need is a specialist that can examine it to determine A, is the testicle there? And B, if the testicle is there, is it retractile or is it truly undescended? And then three, if there's a hernia there. Now, you may not feel the hernia and the hernia may not present itself until you actually do the surgery and then you see the hernia. Because if you have a hernia, you'll know you have a hernia. 
And for me, typically, if you're under age two and you have a hernia, I will put a laparoscope into the abdomen to look on the other side because I don't like to take children back for a second surgery to look on the other side to see if there's a hernia. Because you do, under age two, if you have a hernia on one side, you do have an increased risk of having a contralateral hernia on the other side. So if that happens, then I'm just going to fix the hernia the same day. Now, some surgeon will go all the way up to age five, and I think that's okay too. I think that's surgeon preference. So for me, I don't, you know, for me, between two and five. You know, um, where if I do find a hernia on one side, then I will look on the other side to uh, to see. So hopefully um, this episode has been educational. I hope it helps. Um, and if you like me to continue doing this and you find it helpful, please subscribe. We are on Spotify, Facebook, YouTube, um, fa- um, Instagram. Twitter, well, I guess it's X now, X formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> so, and so, um, but anyways, if you do like the what I'm what I'm doing and you find it helpful, because uh, really this is just me doing this just to really educate the public uh, on kind of urologic conditions and men's things that has to do with men and women too. And so. Uh, please subscribe and um, and tell me what you think. Price list, take it to the moon. Price list, one day will be soon. What is price list? Take it to the moon.